uh, sharing and then you can share. I think let's give it two more minutes and then start. Um, because we often find people um, um, start registering just before it's the start. <laughs> um, yeah. And then the, it's very strange. I'm not sure if they're worried that they'll lose the the email that gives them the link or something.
Okay, I think maybe let's start um, so that we also stick to time because I see that people just keep trickling in. Um, so uh, today's uh, webinar will be given by Professor Teresa Rousseau, who is actually the current president of uh, SAIS uh, from, well, from the CIA, really. Um, and she uh, is from the University of Pretoria. Um, and um, she did her MDCHB in Stanbosch and uh, also did an MPhil and MPH and then did a double major PhD one in philosophy. Uh, hopefully we'll get a bit of philosophy today and the one in neology. Um, so um, she's a clinician scientist and her main focus is on, is, is on HIV and, and, and other related infectious diseases. Um, she has a specific interest in, in HIV-associated uh, drug resistance uh, and systemic immune responses um, or immune activation. Um, she's a member of the World Health Organization, um, Organization's Research and Innovation Working Group uh, or, or HIV uh, REST NET, as well as uh, other uh, scientific committees. Um, she also has a keen interest in ethics, which is uh, what her talk today is going to be about. Um, so it's not going to be, I think she will touch on immunology, but, but it is mainly on ethics. Because um, I think, you know, in everything that we probably do, uh, ethics feature a lot in, in whatever research that we actually do. So I think it's good to know about that, the do's and don'ts and, and, and uh, um, I think that's that's part and parcel of research, actually, and probably is the main thing that we need to worry about in research. Um, uh, she's uh, also a co-chairperson of the of the uh, research ethics committee at the University of Victoria, um, and is also involved in in um, research and ethics of of integrity in in research. Uh, over to you, Teresa, and uh, thank you. Lovely, thank you so much for the introduction, Sibelo. Um, good afternoon, everybody. I'm very happy to be talking to you about this topic. I know it's, it's slightly different from what you're used to for, from size, um, but I think it's something that we don't talk about enough, um, and it is really important for our profession. So I'm just gonna switch off my camera for the duration of the talk. Um, just to ensure that we have enough bandwidth. Right, so I'm going to talk to you very briefly about the key considerations for responsible conduct of research. I'm going to give you some examples of irresponsible practice because I think that's one of the easiest ways to understand, you know, the issues involved. And then we will talk about best practice and guidance. And at the end, there will be some time for discussion or for questions. So just to start with a definition, so scientific misconduct is the non-adherence to rules, regulations, guidelines, and commonly accepted professional codes or norms. And we have the three cardinal sins, and that is fabrication, falsification, or plagiarism. And this can happen at any stage of the research, from the study design, actually conducting the study, reviewing the research, um, results of other people or reporting your own results. But there are also other questionable research practices. And these are actions that violate the values of the research enterprise and that they are, they are actually detrimental to the research process. And there are many such examples, but you can think about um, intentional protocol violations, dropping outliers from a data set, falsification of a bias sketch or resume, 
also conflicts of interest, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. I think in the modern day society, what I really want to um, emphasize is that research misconduct can also include omitting relevant data, manipulating images, and we'll spend some time on that. And then of course, in the era of genomics, deliberately attempting to re-identify people from research data. Importantly, it does not include honest differences in either designing or executing your study or even interpreting the results or poor quality research. Of course, that's never um, a good thing, but that's not research misconduct per se, unless the intention was there to deceive. So the flip side of, the, of research misconduct is then responsible conduct of research. And it really has three major pillars, accountability, responsibility, and transparency. And all of these, these things remind us that we have to do the right thing. But let's look at where cases um, where things have gone really wrong. Now, I think many of you may be surprised to know that some of the giants of scientific discovery have been accused of research misconduct. For instance, Gregor Mendel and Isaac Newton, um, they were accused of having data that's just too good to be true. In the case of Mendel, um, his findings were so close to his ideal values in his hypothesis that it's generally accepted that he actually only showed specific results that met um, his expectation, and he selectively um, left some cases out of his data set. Also, Charles Darwin, the father of evolution, in this book that's not as famous as The Origin of Species, um, it's called The Expression of the Emotions in Man and Animals, um, he actually admitted that some of the photos in this book were staged um, or were retouched or altered afterwards in order to show that which he wanted to show and not what he necessarily captured on camera. But the first documented case that I know of was really in 1912, and this is known as the Piltdown Man. It really caused um, a lot of excitement because hominid remains were found in Sussex, and it was widely believed to be the missing link be between the human and the great apes. And unfortunately, when the skull was examined carefully, they could show that it was the skull of a modern man and the jawbone of an orangutan. And it's not really sure who committed this misconduct, one of these two gentlemen, or maybe both of them. But closer to the laboratory and the rest of the, the examples, I'm really gonna focus um, on laboratory-based research. Um, this is one very famous case that you may know of. It's one of the earliest well-documented cases. It was a dermatologist who was doing um, research on skin grafts in the 1970s. And of course, the holy grail of transplant is that you can transplant from one person with specific genetic makeup to another person with a, genetic, a different genetic makeup without rejection. So he claimed that he could transplant skin between animals of different genetic strains. So you can see in the picture, he transplanted um, skin from a black mouse to that of a white mouse. And he claimed that he had eliminated rejection by growing the transplant in a specific nutrient broth um, that he had concocted in the laboratory. But unfortunately, it was all a fraud and he had merely used a pink uh, uh, an ink marker um, for the black skin, and he never had done any of the transplant work that he claimed. Also a very um, well-known case and a very important one is um, the world-renowned stem cell researcher, Dr. Wusik Wong, who was really called the pride of Korea because he cloned the first dog. And this is the dog that he managed to clone, um, Snuppy, and he used um, somatic nuclear cell transfer. And this was a major step forward in the field. And because of this, the government had invested um, very heavily into his research. So Dr. Wong claimed that his stem cell research had cloned patient-specific stem cells. That was the next step, moving, moving from an animal to a human. And of course, if he could clone embryos, that would once again overcome the problem of rejection 
um, by the recipients. But unfortunately, he had never done this. Um, he was also accused of using oocytes from his female um, laboratory scientists um, without getting um, proper clearance from the ethics committee. And sadly, he obtained the registration of 20,000 people who wanted to participate in the research. And most of them were quite, quite desperate and they needed this technology. So he gave them false hope and he exploited them for his own gain. So there's a lot of, of debate about why did he do this? Was it a desire for fame or was there so much pressure and that he was just fearful of disappointing um, everybody if he says that he could not do this. The other example that um, is also a very sad one is Anil Potty who worked in lung cancer. Now this was quite revolutionary at the time. Um, he worked with microRNAs and he specifically examined patients with small cell carcinoma of the lung. And he claimed to have started the whole precision medication um, era because he said he could predict with the genetic signature of these patients who would respond to treatment. And he claimed he had examined 33 patients, but when, um, and that six of those had responded. But when they went into the laboratory records and the clinical trial records, they only found four patients and none of them had responded. They also found many more falsified data um, and all of his published papers and grant applications were retracted. For the university, there was also a lot of, of harm because the participants in these studies filed lawsuits against the university. Um, so he was obviously dismissed from his post um, and uh, the, the university had to make payouts to the participants. Closer to home, um, not that this is a laboratory-based study, but I also just wanted to show that, you know, in South Africa, we um, are not um, unfortunately exempt from, from these practices. So an oncologist at the University of Advertisement was doing research in women with breast cancer, and he used very high-dose chemotherapy. And he presented these data at an international conference. And there was a lot of surprise because people had tried this earlier and it did not work. So researchers tried it once again and it still did not work. So they sent an audit team to South Africa to come and look at his research. What was he doing differently? And unfortunately, they could only find 61 of the 90 case records that he presented about. Only 27 had sufficient records to verify that these participants were eligible for the trial, and only 25 had received the assigned therapy. When they dug a little bit deeper, they found that nine other trials reported by Biswoda had not received, um, had not been received by the ethics committee and had not been approved by any ethics committee. The next two examples I want to show because these are the most um, prolific cases that I came across, unfortunately, in the same field in anesthesiology. Um, so uh, Jacob Bolt was a leading specialist in the management of intravenous fluid during an um, anesthetic. And unfortunately, most of his data were fabricated. So 88 of his studies have been withdrawn. And you can imagine the far reaching effect this has on clinical practice because his data had been used in meta-analyses, in guideline documents, and a lot of these are now clearly wrong. This is made even worse by another colleague of his who had 126 papers that had been totally fabricated, also in the field of anesthesiology. And it's, um, it's estimated that at least 183 of his papers contain some fabricated data. And people have described this as if somebody was sitting at his desk and wrote a novel about a research idea. He actually never did any of the research that he claimed. Coming back to immunology, in the field of HIV vaccines, um, in 2014, there was a trial um, and this researcher claimed that he had found a target for an HIV vaccine. You will know that this is widely elusive. They've been looking for such a target for a very, very long time. And he claimed that this target elicited broadly neutralizing antibodies. But unfortunately, 
it came to light that he had added human antibodies to the samples of rabbit blood to um, enhance the utility of his experimental vaccine. He was sentenced to almost five years in prison and he had to return $7.2 million to the NIH. And this really cast the spotlight on immunology. So just briefly, these are two researchers that have in the past few years been discredited. Um, Sylvia bulfone Paus, unfortunately, um, was trialed by internet. So there's a huge smear campaign against her. But they have found that at least six of her articles had fabricated images um, and that the images had been severely manipulated, probably by students in her lab. Um, but because she was the head of the lab, she had to take responsibility for it. And then the gentleman on the right, he is known as the father of immunological or um, um, immunology of nutrition. And he has public, um, published widely. But unfortunately, a lot of the data was fraudulent. And there was a massive lawsuit that he lost. Um, he lost $132 million in that lawsuit. And he was stripped of his Order of Canada. Um, and of course, many of his publications have now been retracted. But these cases are just the tip of the iceberg, unfortunately. Um, when you look, when you just do a regular search on the internet, you will find so many instances of research misconduct, um, and especially in the basic sciences where we work. So how common is it? Um, there are not many large studies, and of course it's very difficult because people don't regularly um, admit that they've conducted research um, that was maybe falsified or um, fabricated. But this was a survey of almost 3,500 NIH-funded researchers from the US, and about 1% admitted to one of the three cardinal sins. Almost 5% used the same data or results in two or more publications, 10% admitted to inappropriate authorship practices, 15% to dropping observations or data points on a gut feeling, another 15% to changing the design or the methodology because of pressure from a funding source, and 27% at inadequate record keeping. And that is really something we need to look at because if there is an investigation, that's of course the only proof you have that you did do things correctly. Um, there was also a systematic review and meta-analysis by Daniel, uh, Daniel Fanelli. They looked at 21 surveys, uh, mostly in the developed world, and about 2% of people admitted to either fabricated or falsified or modified data or results at least once, and 33.7% admitted to questionable research practices. And then interestingly enough, when they reported on the behavior of their colleagues, it was double that. So very interesting. And we find the same also in, in uh, research from the UK, where 5.7% of um, new consultants admitted to past personal misconduct, but when they had to report about what they've observed in others and colleagues, it was 10 times that, 55%. So probably the 55 is, is closer to the truth. How about the situation in Africa? Now, once again, we have very little data. Um, a student of mine actually did the first research in this field on the continent, and it looked at the prevalence of scientific misconduct in a group of researchers attending a conference in Nigeria. 68.9% admitted to at least one form of scientific misconduct. Seven, uh, 42 admitted to um, one of the cardinal sins, and 36% to questionable research practices. And I have to emphasize that disagreement about authorship was one of the most common um, questionable research practices that arose. I then worked with colleagues from the Human Sciences Research Council, and we looked at retracted articles with authors or co-authors from the African region. And we used the Retraction Watch database. We searched under um, African countries. We looked for studies um, between 2014 and 2018. Um, we found 245 retractions. The countries mostly involved were Egypt and South Africa. 
um, followed by Nigeria and Algeria. But if we look at the research output from these countries, you can see um, it's probably not surprising because Egypt and South Africa really um, published most data on the continent. There were eight disciplines involved. The four most common were basic life sciences, physical sciences, human sciences, and business science. And the reasons for retraction were mostly plagiarism and duplication. Now we found that junior researchers were more likely to plagiarize and that senior researchers were more likely to duplicate articles. And this is most likely because of the pressure to publish um, so salami slicing, trying to get more out of, out of data than that is really allowable. Also found 10 cases of fabrication or falsification of data. So it's not a lot, but it is there. And then importantly, error in data analysis. And the journals are becoming quite strict on this at the moment. Um, we have many journals insisting that you upload your raw data and that it can be reanalyzed. So something that, that we should really be careful um, that we do this appropriately and we document carefully how we perform the analysis. So there have been quite a number of articles in the last five years or so about the scourge of um, unreliable data that is out there. So this was, for instance, um, a study that looked at more than 5,000 clinical trials published in some of the best journals and 90 trials had underlying statistical patterns that were unlikely to be true. And it is scary that we are using data from these trials to make treatment decisions. And the author stated that it may be the case that certain treatments may need to be withdrawn from use based on the false data that's out there. There's also a big problem with the reproducibility of data. Um, this was a study specifically in oncology, and we see 70% of, of studies were in oncology. And when they try to reproduce the, um, the model exactly as described in the manuscript, they only succeeded in 7% of the time. And 26% of studies had to be abandoned because of inconsistencies made it impossible to continue with the research. So they have called for an open investigation into the reproducibility, especially of cancer biology research. Now, of course, we should remember that there are many technical reasons why experiments cannot be reproduced. Um, sometimes there are unrecognized variables, especially if it's a very complex experimental model. Sometimes the sample size is insufficient. There's a poor documentation of procedures. Sometimes people don't want to share their methods because they scare people may um, try to, to reproduce their findings. Something that's becoming very important in immunology as we move into single cell data is the misinterpretation of technical noise as biological signal. And then of course, we know that people are more likely to report the most positive findings. So there is publication bias out there as well. And then finally, of course, it can mean that the data had actually been fabricated. Some of you may have seen this article. It was in the Daily Maverick, amongst others, um, in last month, where scientists were sounding the alarm on badly run medical studies. And they looked at 1,600 clinical trials that test medical interventions and found that over 60% of them showed a high risk of bias meaning that the findings um, are probably or could be spurious and that we can't have confidence in them. And this is really an indictment. It goes back to study design um, and really the, the way that we conceptualize research. Um, and they had a scathing attack on science saying that, you know, we, we claim to be speaking the truth, but if one looks at this objectively, then just look at what we are doing. And I think we've all felt it. You know the hype about ivermectin um, as a treatment option for COVID-19. You also know that there was a meta-analysis that showed benefit. Um, and a lot of people in South Africa used this. A lot of medical people gave this to their patients. And unfortunately, when you go back to the, to the data, many of the major trials that investigated this had signs of fraud. 
um, they were either obvious signs of fabrication or errors so critical that they invalidated the study completely. Some studies listed patients who never actually participated. And in other studies, they placed patients who were more likely to die, the most high risk patients in the placebo group and the healthiest patients in the ivermectin group. And of course, then the data will be skewed. And the studies where the science was actually good generally showed no benefit. But you know, despite that, there is still this hype that science is trying to hide this affordable medication um, for, for some nefarious reason. I want to spend a little bit of time on the new kid on the block. And this is manipulating figures and even images. And it is generally believed that the prevalence of this is underestimated. So we don't have um, a true prevalence, but in some journals, it's estimated to be more than 30%. And of course, those are only the images where one can detect problems. Um, in some, of, some images, it's impossible to even look for, for manipulation. Now, I just wanna share a few um, examples with you to show how easy it is to manipulate images in this current era. Um, some of you may have seen this on social media. It was trending for quite some time. What they did to the poor lion that you see roaring um, in the MGM intro, um, that they strapped him down on a table and then you know, made him roar. But in fact, this was a real lion that went in for an MRI scan because of disease. Also, this was um, trending on the food channels for quite some time, this amazing fried rice wave but it's not that at all. It is actually a sculpture that you can buy in the store. This one was quite naughty. It was showing an astronaut that was smoking marijuana in space. And actually it was an astronaut who wanted to surprise his um, fellow astronauts with Easter eggs. And then finally, I think we would all love to go to this dream castle and spend your holiday there but unfortunately it doesn't exist. It's just a combination of two photos. So very easy. I mean, that looks very real if you look at the way that they've integrated these two images and it can be very difficult to detect. So there was another study quite recently where they looked at the prevalence of inappropriate image duplication in biomedical research publications. They looked um, at 40 scientific journals, more than 20,000 papers, and almost 4% contained problematic figures. And at least half of them were suggestive of deliberate manipulation. This study was quite, um, made me quite sad because I think this is something a lot of us feel very passionate about. Um, and this was a researcher from Australia who showed that um, baby fish prefer to eat plastic over their natural food and that there were so many uh, microplastics in the environment that fish had actually started resorting to eating these microplastics rather than their own food. It was a nature publication, um, and it of course wanted to show the effect of climate change on coral reef fish. When other scientists tried to reproduce this, there was a 100% replication failure. Um, and then scientists started questioning the number of lionfish um, that they claim to have used in the study. And the article actually shows um, an image of 50 fish, but what the researcher had done, so on the left-hand side, this is what was published. Um, on the right-hand side is if you actually um, place the fish in the order of when the images were taken, it's quite clear that they were just six fish and not 50, and that the images had been manipulated, swapped, rotated, turned around, um, in order to make them look different. They also had different backgrounds inserted, um, but they were not 50, they were only six fish. And um, this publication has been retracted. Also the person who did this and um, was quite scathing about peer review, um, saying that, you know, the peer reviewers could have done that as well. You know, why didn't they look for that? And that is a whole new level of, of peer review. I think that would be expected of people. So I think be aware of image manipulations. Um, it can lead to accusation of research misconduct. 
And actually, when you look at the Office of Research Integrity at the in the United States, 67% of cases where they've completed the, the misconduct investigation involved image manipulation. So let me give you a few examples of what you can and you cannot do. So at the top is the original image. You can, of course, do color enhancement. So you can see on the, light, the, the left hand side, um, you can use the same in, image, but just um, highlight some of the, the pertinent areas with color. On the right hand side, um, the researcher has used too much contrast and saturation. So the background cells disappear and that you're not allowed to do. Also splice and paste. Um, so if you're combining multiple images into one image, you have to clearly indicate this by using a dividing line and with labels so that people can see it's two images, not like on the right hand side where you can see it now looks like one image. Same with cropping. So you can um, highlight a specific area, but you cannot do that by deleting the background data or the cause loss of data. So the right way to do it is to use a magnification panel and of course to show what kind of magnification you are using and the background is still clearly visible. Uh, on the right hand side, you can see that's now been divorced from its background. Um, and it can mean something completely different. And in quite a few cases that I've been involved in with image manipulation, this is what researchers did, is they cut out specific sections and then um, pretended that those were different experiments that had been conducted. What else must you do? You must clearly document all the changes you made to an image in your publication. Always retain the unprocessed image for your records that you can exactly show what you did. And then, of course, follow the journal guidelines because they will tell you what is the right kind of processing that is permissible and what not. There are also some lovely websites if you want to look at um, examples of what to do and not to do. But why does all of this matter? You know, why do we take a whole hour to talk about this? Well, of course, there are multiple harms that can follow, not only to patients, but also to researchers, to the whole discipline, to institutions, and then, of course, to science as a whole, because it undermines public trust in medical research. And I think we all saw this so clearly with the COVID-19 pandemic that it seems to be um, something that we've lost is the trust that people have in the correctness and the accuracy of science. Also, as I showed you with those um, anesthesiology studies, it corrupts the scientific record and it leads to false conclusions. And for me, this is really the crux of the matter. It threatens the special claim science has on truth, which relies on the belief that its methods are purely rational and objective. Each and every case of fraud serves to undermine the public's trust in the research enterprise. Let's look at some consequences. Um, I'm just going to give you a few examples, but this has happened to multiple researchers. Um, so this researcher from Oslo, he had a paper in Lancet for his PhD. And unfortunately, the moment that that paper was published, there were complaints where people say, you know, there is, it's not possible to have a database of 900 patients with oral cancer um, in his research area. So he had actually made up that database and 15 of his papers and his PhD was retracted. This is the first scientist to be jailed for fraud. He was a very prominent scientist in the field of aging, menopause, and hormone replacement therapy. His misconduct was exposed by a formal lab technician, former lab technician. And we see this quite commonly, that the people who expose um, these fraudsters are often junior people working in the same laboratory or um, somebody who's left the laboratory already. He eventually pleaded guilty to falsifying 17 grant applications and fabricated data in 10 research papers. And then of course, I told you about the harm that came to patients because of the oncology, the breast cancer oncology trials, where women were exposed to very high dose chemotherapy that is of course extremely toxic and a large number of women died because of this fraudulent claim. 
Also, we live with the consequences still of this gentleman, Andrew Wakefield, who is, of course, um, the author of the infamous Lancet paper that linked autism with the measles, mumps, and rubella vaccine. So just to pause here for a little bit, let's see what Andrew Wakefield did. So he published a study based on 12 children. He did not get proper consent to examine the children. He had altered facts about the children. He received money from a lawyer that was looking for a link between the vaccine and autism. And the consequence was that he undermined public trust in the vaccine and caused many people to still refuse vaccines. If we look at this, um, this is um, just from one of the, the other sources that I looked at. They said he had no statistical analysis because, you know, his group was so small. He had no control group. It relied on people's memories. So it was actually retrospective. And he made very vague conclusions that weren't scientifically or statistically valid. And immediately a publication, and that was in 1998, 10 out of the 12 authors issued a retraction stating that no causal link was established between the MMR vaccine and autism as the data were insufficient. But it took until 2010 for Lancet to issue a proper retraction. And even after the re retraction and even after multiple other studies that have looked at this, we still have this legacy. So if you just look at other studies that have been conducted from 1999 up to 2012, the last study looking at almost 15 million children, no link was found. Yet, one in four parents in the United States believe that some vaccines are linked to autism. And almost 2% of them refuse vaccination because of this belief or other religious beliefs. And this, as you all know, as especially in the immunology field, has caused massive outbreaks of measles in France and in the UK, for instance. Also an outbreak of whooping cough in the US um, because of spillover from the MMR vaccine to people not wanting vaccines at all. We're going to briefly talk about conflict of interest because I think this is something that should be on our radar. So this is a situation where there are financial or other personal considerations that have the potential to compromise or bias your judgment. And there are broad categories that are either tangible, such as a financial relationship, or it can be intangible, like an interpersonal relationship, your act academic activities, or even scholarship. So a conflict of interest in and of itself is not misconduct but it must be acknowledged and managed. Some examples that I thought are important for us as well, this is from the NIH. So if you are involved with commercial sponsors of research, um, if you are a director or you have stock or you receive any kind of compensation from them as a consultant or honoraria um, or non-research travel or gifts, that should always be declared. And why is this important? Well, we know um, of at least one death that was directly caused by a conflict of interest. Briefly going to tell you about Jesse Gelsing Gelsinger. Um, he was 18 years old. He had an ornithine transcarb amylase deficiency, um, which impairs ammonia metabolism. And he was doing very well on a diet that reduced the ammonia in his, in his system. And he could have survived on that for a very long time. But he decided to join a gene transfer experiment that was conducted at the University of Pennsylvania. And he was injected with an adenovirus that was carrying the corrected gene. And unfortunately, he developed a massive immune response that was triggered by the use of this adenovirus. It led to multiple organ failure and brain death, and he died after four days. Now, why do I say this is a conflict of interest? The principal investigator of the study and the head of the institute where the study was conducted had substantial financial stakes in Genovo, and this was the company that produced this gene-altered adenovirus. Genovo also sponsored a lot of the research that was conducted at the institute. And Jesse was actually included as a substitute for another volunteer who had dropped out, 
and he was included despite the fact that his ammonia levels were so high that they should have excluded him. It also transpired that the researcher had failed to report to the ethics committee that two patients had experienced serious side effects from the gene therapy, and the informed consent failed to mention the deaths of monkeys that had been given similar treatment. So withholding data, not being upfront and open about the risk of, of research also can lead to harm. Um, and many claim that it can be worse than a financial conflict of interest. If we just look at other studies that looked at conflict of interest, um, this was um, a study where they looked at 70 articles about calcium channel antagonists. You may remember about 20 years ago, there was a great controversy about whether they were harmful or helpful. And there was a statistically significant difference in people who supported them um, or had studies that supported the use of calcium channel antagonists, 100% of them were funded by industry um, and they had a financial conflict, where when you look at people who were critical of their use, only 43% of them were funded by, um, by industry, and that difference was statistically significant. So a conflict of interest is not negative in and of itself, but it must be declared. You must look at the potential impact and it must always be acknowledged. So we're gonna finish off with a, some best practice and guidance, how to promote research integrity. We try to focus on the positive, not always on the negative. So there is the 2010 Singapore Statement on Research Integrity. I hope that all the institutions that you belong to um, are subscribed and have actually ratified this um, guidance because it is one of the most important ones in the field. It holds research institutions responsible for creating a climate that's conducive to desirable behavior, but the focus is largely on the researcher and it tries to cultivate an appropriate attitude and behavior in researchers as professionals. And the four fundamental principles are honesty, accountability, courtesy and fairness, and good stewardship. On an individual level, it's important to have strongly developed moral and ethical reasoning skills. Um, our institutions should promote appropriate conduct in teaching and mentoring because people learn from their seniors and what they see is often more influential than what they are, set, what they are told or what they are taught in a class. And always reflect on your own knowledge and understanding and contribute to discussions. I'm very glad to see that many people join today. And this is a way that we try to, to have discussions um, and make people more aware. At an institutional level, there must be increased awareness. In the Nigerian study, we found that falsification was related to low effectiveness of an institution's rules and procedures. So it's really important that there are good ethical and scientific review processes, that there's effective monitoring of the research process. Unfortunately, this is often not possible because of the human resource restraints at the ethics committees. One important place is departmental presentations of research work, um, and then clear policies on how research should be stored. Many of these instances of research misconduct the laptops disappeared or they broke or, you know, and that there was no other record of the research. And they should, of course, at the extreme, be policies for the punishment for scientific misconduct. Science is also starting to fight back. So there's an image integrity database, which is um, machine learning. It is really quite interesting. It can detect um, some manipulated images. And we have these, and we call them the sleuths, they actually go through articles and they look for any sign of misconduct. There's also uh, fact-checking for nucleotide sequences. You can imagine how easy it is to manipulate nucleotide sequences to show what you want them to show. So there is the seek and blast in tool um, that is getting better every year. It's not foolproof, but it really um, is, is quite a useful tool to use. And even now, and I think this is going to be the future, um, stat check. So this is specifically for psychology um, articles where they can redo the stats 
they um, unfortunately can't use tables, but if they go through the, the machine, goes through the article and it redoes the statistics, um, and then they look if the results are similar. And I think we will have more sophisticated software going forward um, that people make sure that the stats um, was also correctly done. So in conclusion, I think our goal in, in science and in research is the pursuit of the truth and nothing but the truth. And the intention is crucial. You know, we do make mistakes. We know that um, people like Samuel Smile said, you never made a mistake, never made a discovery. But as important is what Immanuel Kant said, it's about the good will. We may all err, but it should not be based on the intention or the will to deceive. So honesty and truth must remain the foundations of the scientific process. Without it, it must fail. So I thank you for your attention. I hope I've given you some food for thought and I'm now happy to um, take some questions. Great. Um... Thank you, Teresa. I think <laughs> you definitely gave us a, a lot of food for thought. Um, yeah, I'm just thinking. Uh, I mean, yeah, there's just there's just so much, you know, because I guess I, I mean I, I don't truly believe that a lot of researchers would intentionally deceive. Perhaps a lot of people fall into this. Um, either they are they are misrepresenting or misanalyzing the data or there's you know sometimes you know some pis are so busy that they are not completely aware of what is going on so they they i guess they believe in trust that you are doing the right thing all the time and uh, and sometimes uh, you know you can never always guarantee that so i i guess it, it yeah, I guess it's, there's just so many things that we, we have to worry about and uh, some within our control and some maybe not within our control. Yeah, what is quite, quite interesting, um, these highly prolific cases were all brilliant people, um, you know, brilliant scientists. They were at prof professorial level or above. Um, and a lot of them said that they were frustrated by the the messiness of science, you know, that it was not clean results. Mm. You know, they wanted to show a beautiful picture. Um, and then they started manipulating. And because they were very clever, um, they got mm. away with it for a long time, up to a point where, you know, I think they crossed a, a boundary where it went into frank misconduct. Mm. Mm. Uh, I saw a hand from Vegas. Vegas. Thank you, Sabello. Um, yeah, it was a mistake, but I can still ask a question. Um, Go for it. <laughs> thank, thank you very much for that lovely presentation, Teresa. Um, yeah, I've, I've been following the whole pandemic and COVID quite closely, and especially when it came to ivermectin and the, um, the whole craze and uh, people punting the use of ivermectin. So it's, it's and I think we, there's still so many groups in America uh, critical physician gr groups that still promoting ivermectin now even for long COVID and for um yeah so it seems like um wakefield caused so much havoc with autism and mm. um well causing people not to vaccinate due to his st uh, um, studies we could even see ivermectin <laughs> usage for a long time still <laughs> Yes, thanks, because for that, I, I totally agree with you. And it's become very political, unfortunately. Um, so, you know, the moment that it's mixed with politics and with power, um, it becomes almost untouchable. So I think we just need to speak the truth. I think what didn't help was that respected scientists um, actually came out in ivermectin, often on social media which I think was, you know, if we learn something from this epidemic or this pandemic is there's a place for social media and it's not really for, I think, for scientists to speak on, on um, topics that they're not experts in. I agree 100%. Uh, Nancy? 
Um, thank you. Thank you so much, Teresa. This was such an eye-opening um, talk um, and a little bit disheartening at the same time. My question has to do with the Australian uh, researcher and the supposedly fish which prefer plastic. Do you agree that um, some of the responsibility should be on the reviewers, the peer reviewers, um, because this wasn't a blatant kind of oversight of bad data or whatever, like the reviewers needed to really look at the data and in fact, you know, rotate it and turn it around. Is that kind of what the, um, the expectation is as a reviewer for a journal or, um, I don't know, yeah. Nancy, that's a critical question, and it, it does worry me because you know your increasingly your name is published with the review that you conducted, and you know it's just taking longer and longer to take to to do a proper review. Um, so if we are expected to to spot image manipulation, um, you know if you have tools, then that is one thing. But I looked at that fifty fish, and I would not. It would have not occurred to me exactly. um, that that this is what they had done. Um, so, you know, I think it's it's quite difficult with, with images. As mm -hmm. I say, there are people now that specialize in it. And the best way that I can see it is almost like turn it in, that there's some software screening by the journal, um, mm -hmm. you know, that they look for manipulation, they look at the stats, they look at plagiarism, and only when those are clear, they send it to a reviewer. Um, that's what I would say is ideal because I find it scary. I, there's no way I would have seen it. Um, mm -hmm. I've also looked at a lot of, of gels because that's one thing that's that's relatively easy to, to manipulate. Mm -hmm. um, and once again, very difficult. You know, people turn them around um, or they, they move the ladders up. Um, and, but I'm not, I, you know, I, I think we we have a trust in our colleagues and we think that you know what they show us is actually real. You must go in with almost a different mindset, you know, almost a mindset that, you know, where are you cheating um, to see those kind of things? Yeah, I agree. Thank you. Um Teresa, I just had you know two two questions around well, one, the responsibility of the ethics research committees, because uh, I guess maybe, you know, what should be, so if we do find that a researcher may be doing something that they shouldn't be doing, is the idea that we go into a punishment phase or is the idea that we, we kind of correct the, 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 the mistake? You know, because, I, you know, I, maybe, I, I'm not sure, if, I don't think that a lot of people deliberately do things wrong. Uh, mm -hmm. But if we do find that somebody has committed something that they shouldn't have been doing, um, how? what is the responsibility of the research uh, committee? Mm -hmm. and, and my second question was around, you know, I think that's probably one thing that we've seen with COVID is that perhaps it, it's becoming more and more difficult to for science to be completely not, influenced by politics or money, you know, mm -hmm. and, and, you know, you made some examples where, you know, somebody is funded by a company. Yes, they fund them to do research, but how do we separate that from then influencing everything else that goes on beyond that? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah, unfortunately, you know, money makes the world go round, eh? And, you know, research is so expensive that, it's, it's a very tenuous relationship that we need to look at. But let me start with the research ethics committee. So um, what is, is prevalent in the, in the US is that every institution has a research integrity officer. And that's not something that's really common in South Africa. We find that it's often the chair of the ethics committee who is now also the research integrity officer. And they're actually two different things. So um, I think, firstly, there should be some investment in these kind of offices at, in institutions, that um, there's a direct pathway and that there are processes in place to protect the whistleblower. I mean, it's no um, wonder that people first leave an institution before they report because, you know, it's often the whistleblower that is blamed, um, you know, that is 
uh, that lose their job, many, many instances like that. So um, I think it's important that there are adequate protections in place and that it's a safe environment for people to question research. Then it's up to the, the protocols in place. What was encouraging from the African data that we looked at is that most of the people in that database had only a single um, error that they made. You know, it was a single instance. They were not repeat offenders. Having said that, there were people who were more than 10 retractions. Um, so those are the people that you really want to punish. The others, I think um, it should be training, education, um, assistance, you know, because you can correct a lot of, of what has happened. Um, but once somebody has shown that they repeatedly do the same thing, and that you'll find with all of these examples that I gave you, um, is it's repeat offenses and multiple articles retracted. Those are the people that, that it's probably better to um, sanction, you know, that, that um, they don't publish at all. So that's what I would, would say about the, the first question. The second one, you know, about money and politics, I don't, I don't know what to tell you. It is, it's going to become an increasing problem. Um, you also see when people present at a conference, they have this long, you know, this huge slide with, you know, 10 diff different companies that they consult for. And they just sort of, you know, these are my disclosures and go on. You know, it's, it's become standard practice, but nobody really pays much attention to it. Um, so it's an issue that makes me uncomfortable, but it's something that we need to manage. I don't think we can get rid of, of that situation easily. Sorry, Raymond, go ahead and unmute it. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting that uh, it's, it's a disclosure, but you know, nobody questions the disclosure beyond uh, the disclosure. Exactly, exactly. Hi, uh, there is, so thank you for the lovely talk. I mean, um, the landscape of science is so competitive. Um, for the high profile cases that you've described, do you think that the pressure to get funded uh, serves as a motivation uh, for, for research misconduct? Absolutely. I think that's a, that's a great question. Thanks, Raymond. Um, they have shown, and we also showed in the African data, that um, pressure for tenure, so getting a, a permanent position, um, and pressure to publish, those were major things. Um, and we actually, and others as well, have recommended quite strongly that we move away from this idea that the more publications you have, the better. You know, um, the H index and all these metrics, because they fuel competition, but not in a good way. And I think that's why we saw a lot of duplication um, in our population as well, that, you know, they try to get as much out of it as possible. So that competition can lead to, um, to a lot of bad practices. So, you know, we, we would like to see a time, and it's already started in the Netherlands, for instance, where people don't get a rating. Um, you know, we're all going in that rating um, field, but you don't get a rating. A journal doesn't have an impact factor. Um, so a lot of these articles that I've shown you um, come from science and nature and the major journals. Um, so they have already started a campaign that we move away from an impact factor um, and that you look at the best research from uh, a researcher when they go up for a promotion, not the total number of outputs, but the quality of the outputs. Um, so if these kind of things can be adopted, I mean, it, it would be fantastic. Um, but we've been slow in South Africa. We sort of, I always feel we like a decade behind, you know, we now going into pushing everybody to be rated. Everything is about an impact factor and an H index. And I think it's the wrong way to go. I think it's, it's, it's bad for science. Cool. Um, I cannot see any further questions from the chat or any raised hands. Uh, I mean, I think this is such a, an important topic that you know we can talk about it all day because uh, yeah, it's it's. I think it's it's everyone is kind of 
you know, worried about this and, you know, and, and you know, in, in all levels, right, is that some of the things, you know, you hear of very high profile scientists that you hear that all the paper have been retracted and, you know, and you wonder how much of it do they know that it, it was happening or, or, you know, or, I mean, in all fairness, they should have known, right? If they put their names in that as last authors, they should really, in theory, know and be confident about everything that's in there. And um, so it, it's worrying, you know, it's, yeah. Yeah, yeah. well, thanks for the opportunity to talk about something non-immunological. Um, yeah, and, and thank you, Teresa. I think this is <laughs> really, uh, eye opening. It's just, yeah, it's just so much. I mean, that's that really is the center of research in everything that you do. That is the center ethics of it and, 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 and you know, integrity and and having confidence in, in every single data point that you look at that it is what it's supposed to be and yeah. uh, that nothing has happened to it <laughs> before we saw it. Um, yeah. Well, thank you very much. And thank you all. And thank you to all the people that are involved in, in organizing these webinars and uh, we appreciate it. And I guess we'll see you all in August. I think we have a speaker from UCT. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, thank Teresa. you. Bye. Hello, very interesting. Yeah, it was great. Have a good afternoon. Bye, Sabella. Bye. Bye. Thank you, Vickers. Oh, thank you very much. Bye bye. Okay. Is this the point where you stop the recording, Savelo?